We very much appreciate your uh, input as well as the other brethren preceding you on, on this uh, uh, scripture text with a lot of depth and meaning to it. We uh, thank you for uh, all the thoughts expressed. And we've got the concluding uh, elements of this without partiality and hypocrisy. And I've, I've got to note that the first six items are positive things that we want to get. And these last two that I've assigned with are things we don't want to have, and we want to be sure that we, we root them out from ourselves. But um, that being the case, well, I'll start with partiality. Uh, partiality is being partial or favoring some others over another for improper reasons or improper sentiments. And this is a leading cause of sectarianism, being partial for improper reason leads to sectarianism. Sectarianism is confronted and condemned by the Apostle Paul. You'll remember in 1 Corinthians, the first chapters, verses 11 and 12, they read in part, for it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Shoklo, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? end of quote. The Apostle Paul is bringing out that these are improper divisions, uh, and it's it was sectarianism. Uh, different of the brethren in uh, Corinth were circling themselves in some form of loyalty to all these different uh, leaders that were there, and probably each of these leaders did good. Paul certainly did, Apollos did, and I'm sure Cephas and did, and the point is that Christ is not to be divided, so we shouldn't have this sense of sectarianism about it over personality traits or, or other things uh, along that nature. Paul wasn't condemning anyone for, uh, as he wrote elsewhere, follow me as I follow Christ. That, that's not what he's referring to. This was some uh, form of improper impartiality, which led to sectarianism. Now, one can follow a leader, uh, as I just mentioned, where Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. One can follow a leader because one is actually following the doctrines and the principles taught or advocated by that one. Or one can follow a leader based largely upon personality, blood relationship, marital relationships, or some other form of temporal gain or, or carnal reasoning. Now that kind of partiality, that kind of following is improper. It's misguided and it never ends well. It's not good for the leader, it's not good for the followers. Uh, this tends to lead to a certain exclusion of other brethren or perhaps a favoritism that can become apparent to others and can lead to a sense of uh, disillusionment among brothers and sisters when they see uh, that this kind of sectarian spirit or this partiality on improperly based takes place, uh, they feel excluded, left out, and it leads to hurt feelings, misunderstandings, and the whole concept of the true unity of Christ gets lost uh, in all of that. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very fallen human uh, pattern to fall into and one that we need to resist. The, uh, it's very difficult if one is feeling disillusioned over seeing what they consider to be partiality to try to address it with the individuals that, they're, that they feel this from. Uh, the reason being that it just kind of adds to their pain and hurt and embarrassment. So quite often these, these forms of uh, partiality are suffered uh, by some of the brethren innocently not knowing how to correct it. So there's a, it becomes a trial. It becomes a trial indeed. Partiality diminishes to some extent sympathy, empathy, warmth, kindness, and other aspects of the fruits of the Spirit of Christ. So if one's practicing partiality for improper reasons, and this, can, this will affect our development of all the other fruits of the Spirit, as a matter of fact. Partiality can lead to an undercurrent in an ecclesia that can lead to whisperings and backbitings and a certain sense of being part of a group uh, included and others feel excluded. And uh, if there's an undercurrent like that in an ecclesia, it's very disruptive, unhealthy, and, um, it's, and it, once again, it's very difficult to address. Uh, but this is something that for each of us to try to strive against, and if we become aware of it in ourselves, that's that's our first place to work at it. Partiality can create a sense of reward for being a loyal follower. If it gives us a distorted 
feeling of being included by making others feel uh, excluded or as if they're outsiders. They're, it's almost like a form of tribalism. And it can include uh, a sense of competition as if vying for approval to be part of, of this kind of group. Another word, uh, a modern word for it is clicked. It's being cliquish. And uh, that has no place in the body of Christ for those kind of reasons. And par uh, being partial can be the result of a certain fear. Now, the, the fear that I'm referring to in this is the fear of being rejected by those that you want to have appreciate you. It's a sense of being rejected because it makes you feel lonely. A uh, sense of being rejected because you might uh, interpret that as if you're not being spiritual enough or holy enough or good enough to be part of these certain groups. When, and actually, that might not be the case whatsoever. Uh, but if there's a uh, improper partiality being practiced by some, uh, this is what others outside of that can, can suffer from. And there's this underlying sense of fear of rejection is a, a very common human need. And quite often we don't even realize it, but that's uh, part of us being social animals, as it were. Uh, we do desire to be socially involved. And if we're feeling excluded from some of our brethren um, for improper reasons, uh, that uh, creates a lot of emotional um, damage in individuals to strive against. So we have to work at making sure we're not practicing a wrong uh, partiality. Now, on the other hand, and this is the balance, there is a proper being partial. Now, let me illustrate this. The thought of a proper being partial is the thought of favoring that which is holy and good. We should be partial to what is right, what is honest, what is pure and of good report. This is what I'm going to term principled partiality. It is based on godly principles of justice, truth, and love, not on personalities, advantage, relationships, or other carnal sentiments. Now, I'd like to give an example of what we're referring to in that. Um, and this is uh, from uh, the Apostle Paul's writing. I want you to think, we read earlier from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 12 and 13, where, where the Apostle Paul was condemning a sectarian spirit, uh, improper uh, partiality. Well, here in Romans 16, verses 17 and 18, uh, we're going to, I'll read it to you, but Paul is advocating avoiding certain ones because there's a problem there. It reads, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Uh, end of quote. Now, uh, the simple, I think a better rendition is the unsuspecting. Not that they're simple-minded, but they're unsuspecting. They aren't expecting to have someone who's serving their own belly, in other words, their own egotistical appetites of being in a leadership role, whether it's actually voted in as leadership or just looked to as being a leader. Uh, and sometimes that can be brothers, uh, and, but it can also be sisters who can be looked to as, as leaders, uh, as it were, among some. And it can generate uh, problems. So Paul is saying, if you see this taking place, avoid them. Now, when Brother Russell comments on, on this text, and actually he comments quite, quite a bit, uh, he's making the point that there are various degrees of how there would be this avoiding. Uh, sometimes it would just be a little bit more cool uh, just to demonstrate that there, uh, there's an action here that's serious enough. It's got to be serious enough that it calls for a little bit of uh, avoidance, a little bit of, of coolness to hopefully help that individual realize that they are conducting themselves in an improper way, which is causing harm uh, amongst other brethren. So I'm going to leave that there just to point out that there is an improper partiality, but there are occasions where there's a proper partiality, avoiding. Even though I have to say, and I think you would agree, that the case of having to do that is very rare, gratefully. Uh, it does exist, but it doesn't happen uh, that often. Uh, I'm, uh, I think we're much more concerned with being sure that we aren't being uh, partial in an improper way in ourselves. I think that's what we're confronted with far more often. Now with hypocrisy, 
there's actually a Hebrew word for hypocrisy that's, uh, I said Hebrew, I meant Greek. There's a Greek word used for hypocrisy more often in the New Testament than this word here in the King James that's translated hypocrisy. Uh, this word uh, appears a number of times, six or seven times uh, in the New Testament, but it has the thought of being insincere or feigned. Uh, this is a more commonly used Greek word uh, along this line when we're trying to point out something being sincere or insincere. The scriptural, uh, scripturally, it's used to describe a proper love or faith. And uh, without reading those verses, for example, it's talking about an unfeigned love. That means a sincere, honest love. It talks about an unfeigned faith. That means a faith that is truly based on a relationship with the Heavenly Father by understanding his plans and purposes and thereby understanding his character and understanding the type of God we have our faith in, as well as Jesus, who we have our faith in, and, and his character and conduct. Now, having um, an insincere or a faked or superficial love or faith is, is, is really worse than useless. It doesn't help us in our relationship to God and Jesus, that's for sure. And it really doesn't help us in our relationship to brethren. Uh, far be it that we would practice being sincere, that we would not be phony, but that we would be uh, unfeigned in all of our uh, proper um, relationships. Brother Russell used these terms in the morning resolve. Let me remind you of that. It reads, I will strive to be simple and sincere toward all. Now his thought on the word simple here, I think means unfeigned, not with duplicity. Brother Russell thought simple would be without duplicity. It's just straightforward. What you see is what you get. There's no undercurrent. There's nothing underlying this. It's not two-faced. Uh, the word sincere here, I will strive to be simple and sincere would be, that is from the heart with meaning, a, a meaningful uh, sincerity. And when Brother Russell concludes that sentence, toward all, I'll, I will be strive to be simple and sincere toward all, that shows without partiality. This has the thought of um, that we want to be simple, sincere. We want to be without partiality, without hypocrisy to the greatest extent possible. It has to do with having integrity. It has to do with having integrity. Now, an example, because we can't do better than give scriptural examples of these things, is one found in Galatians, the second chapter, verses 13 and 14, which reads, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, that is, with Peter, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, end of citation, Paul is writing here how Peter and Barnabas and other of the Jewish Christians have been eating with the Gentiles. But when certain Judaizing Christians had come up from Jerusalem, they seemed to come up with an air of holiness and that they were keeping the law and being a Christian and they would not eat with the Gentiles, believers. And so Peter was taken away with this. He was overcome with peer pressure. And Barnabas even followed along with that. And uh, these are very peculiar because both uh, Peter was used to introduce the first Gentile con converts, Cornelius and his family, he used the second key at that time to invite them into the high calling, as it were, directed by God to do so. And Barnabas had worked with Paul amongst the Gentiles for, for a long time. So this was really odd. But this, the word dissimulation here is hypocrisy. And it was a form of hypocrisy. And Paul uh, didn't let it go. He had to address it. But I want you to think about how much harm and how much pain, this uh, emotional pain, this must have caused the Gentile believers who were there witnessing this. It, it was so unchristlike at what, what they had learned that I imagine Paul had to do quite a bit of damage control. And I'm not sure that when Paul confronted Peter and Barnabas over that, maybe they apologized right then and there, which would have helped these, these poor Gentile brethren to feel more accommodated, but it certainly would have been a trial with these Judaizing Christians being there. So that was a, a major confrontation over acting in a hypocritical or a partial way improperly. Now, uh, with that uh, set before us, this example demonstrates the power of peer pressure. 
You know, this dear Peter had suffered being beaten and threatened with more beating and imprisonment if he refused, if, if, if he didn't stop preaching the gospel in the temple precincts. But as soon as he and John were released, uh, he went out and he preached again. So Peter could withstand the torment, torture, the beatings, but here with the emotional, mental peer pressure he caved in. So this is a lesson for us, brethren, how we might think we're standing when we could easily fall, uh, maybe in not this kind of degree here, but in some sense that we could fall into a sectarian pattern or, or, or way of thinking, which we all want to be on guard against. It's, it's a personal matter that each one of us has to look into our hearts, which is undoubtedly why Brother Russell included it as part of the morning resolve, that I will strive to be simple and sincere toward all, because apparently it's a, a very easy, common, sadly, tendency of the fallen human nature. Again, a lot of it's motivated by fear of, of, of being rejected, but that fear can often lead in some sense to rejection of, of others. Now, I like a verse, it's 1 Corinthians 16, verse 14. It's um, from the Weymouth translation. There's just one, one word that I really like that Weymouth provides here. And it's the admonition there is Paul's writing that we should examine our motives that they be motives of agape love. So that if we examine what motivates us in our relationships, and if we can find that it's the principled love, that selfless love, the agape love, if that's our motive, then we can, be, uh, we can have greater confidence that we won't be practicing partiality or hypocrisy. Thereby uh, closing uh, this with a text out of Titus 2 and verse 10, uh, just part of it. But the point is, is that uh, Paul was admonishing Titus and, and all of us by extension, that we should conduct ourselves outwardly in order that we might, quote, adorn the doctrine of God. Adorn the doctrine of God. If we walk the true walk of a Christian without hypocrisy, without uh, uh, partiality, if we can be pure and peaceable and gentle and have mercy, and try to practice righteousness with others. If we put on the good fruits and if we avoid these, faith, these uh, shortcomings, these false shortcomings, whatever we then say to others along the lines of the doctrines of God, it'll have a much greater impact. Because as we know, as commonly said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. May the Lord add his blessing.